everybody. So today we are going to be talking about two different things with a very special guest. So the first thing we're going to talk about is something that I have discussed with Katerina, who is our special guest today, and that is data therapy and why you and your team might actually benefit from it. And the second thing is a piece of wisdom that Katerina had passed on to me, which is how to talk to your end developers or end data scientists about ontologies and how you can get their buy-in by helping them understand that the ontology basically helps them boil down what those business rules are so that they don't necessarily have to go and talk to a bunch of the business owners. So if it sounds interesting to you, keep on watching. My name is Katarina Kari, and currently I'm the lead ontologist at Inter IKEA Systems BV, that is the uh, franchisor for the entire IKEA concept who basically sets the whole standard for how to run an IKEA store or is um, also responsible for, um, for any kind of central definitions about IKEA, the IKEA concept and holds that copyright. Mm -hmm. And that means that um, we are building a knowledge graph central, centrally mm -hmm. to then serve our franchisees. Mm -hmm. who are actually running the IKEA stores in mm -hmm. physical spaces. Mm -hmm. um, but then additionally, those um, companies also run IKEA.com. Mm -hmm. And for that, we need to uh, make sure we are serving them in our best way as a franchisor. Yeah, and, and I wasn't aware of all of the work behind uh, IKEA. But now, because of our interactions at you know, Connected Data World and the Knowledge Graph Conference and a few other things. I've gotten to know you a lot better in, in what you do in your day-to-day -day life. And I mean, I think as soon as we started talking, I was like, oh, kindred spirits, <laughs> because there's so much, you know, in, in the ontology space that, you know, the, the folks that are trying their hardest to do sometimes roll, roll our eyes or have to just shake our heads at things that we see around the business. Um, and yet we're incredibly valuable to that business, right? Like you're connecting all of those franchisees, all of the different things need to be put together on the back end so the franchisees don't have to worry about it as much, which I think is fabulous. Um, and I do know personally uh, some other uh, folks in your same space that are not using Knowledge Graph quite yet. And I know what a mess it is behind the scenes at some of those companies. Yeah. So that goes to show that IKEA is ahead of the game with that, which is pretty cool. So Katarina, can you let me know a little bit about what is your job? Like, what does an ontologist actually do? Yeah, or what does a lead ontologist actually do? <laughs> right. Additionally, because um, well, I mean, an ontologist would. I always tell that I'm I'm basically responsible for how for how the knowledge graph is shaped. And if you don't know what a knowledge graph is, then I say I'm responsible for making sure that uh, computers understand all the information around, for example, the IKEA knowledge mm -hmm. or the home furnished like interior design know-how that yep. we have an abundance of that yep. makes sure computers understand it but I also make sure that it represents it in a way that humans understand it yep. and humans can contribute to it mm -hmm. so at selected endpoints I make sure that humans know exactly what they need to input what kind of information and knowledge they need to yep. input and I make sure that systems can use it likely because we we both know a knowledge graph is a bridge between humans and systems yes exactly exactly nicely put so I do want to make sure because, again, I reference it all the time now on my channel. Just if you could uh, just give us your imparting wisdom um, that you've imparted to me and I've internalized so much that I, I say it to so many people. Um, the, the whole thing that you you said where the, you were explaining to the devs why the ontology just helps them. Like, what does that look like? What, what was that buy-in like? Yeah, developers, when you do software development, you want to take the human out of the loop as much as possible, really automate it, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. least amount of manual effort, just, uh, just minimize that. Yeah. Um, and then when I explain to them that an ontology or a knowledge graph, it basically an ontology is talking to stakeholders and making sure that all the implicit knowledge they have is expressed in an explicit uh, structural format that systems can also read. Then uh, like a light bulb, <laughs> like lit in their head, like, oh, so it means we do not have to talk to stakeholders. And I was like, yes, it means you don't have to talk to stakeholders. You can basically have the ontologist talk to the stakeholders and put yeah. it into a format that you just query. 
And that was like, that was the selling. That was the moment. That was the moment. But actually currently at IKEA, my main task is to upskill interior designers and people who work with products into being able to be ontologists. And and we're calling them knowledge modelers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that comes from the modeling, the knowledge graph knowledge modelers, so that they are not just domain, only domain experts Mm -hmm. to whom I give a ready interface for, and please input your knowledge. But they, they actually make the decisions of, of the, the structure of the knowledge graph. Nice. Of how we, how we, so what kind of properties do we put mm-hmm, in place? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What kind of class hierarchy do we have? The data that's, structure. That, and that's great. I'm so happy to hear that you are empowering your SMEs because I think oftentimes we kind of split the duties. And, you know, sometimes that does have to happen. Like a, a good example is um, like legal knowledge graphs. A lawyer, I mean, they just don't have the time. They they are not really allowed even to, to get into the data structures all the time. Some of them do. In fact, strangely enough, I know a lot of people that are ontologists that used to be lawyers. I don't know what that connection is about, but a lot of them, a lot of them are. <laughs> At least the people I know in my network. My vision is that in the future, anyone who is writing like their master thesis on humanities or doctoral thesis mm-hmm. will also express that uh, same thing in RDF. I love it. I love it. That's great. <laughs> it is because they are always looking at, the, they're kind of systemizing the knowledge. Yeah. They're, they're looking at things and they're creating a model. They're always yeah. creating a model yep. for something. Yep. You describe something, a framework yep. to understand, like especially in history, you do create a framework. Mm-hmm. You do have your central concepts. Yep. And that's like when you were asking, how do we go about it? Yep. I do teach them first the data therapy. So the, oh, I nice. think I heard it from you, the word. Yeah. <laughs> data therapist, <laughs> yeah. Which is basically, what are the things? What are these individuals? What are like the common terms you're using? Yep. Much like you would do for a glossary in yep. uh, humanities <laughs> master thesis. And so so what are the concepts? Yep. And, and how would you group them? Mm-hmm. And with groupings, you can find different things. You can find either uh, class hierarchy or you can find some part whole relationships mm-hmm. or other kinds. So the groups are not, the groupings can like lead you to many things. Yeah, um, yeah. It can also be just a thematic group, so it doesn't actually involve the modeling. And then in the end, like when you, if you have your organization, you know, how would you connect them? Like how do exactly. they then relate to each other? So that's the last step. And and um, yeah, we call it data therapy every day in our team. Yeah, like, nice. I love it. I love it. Most teams love data therapy. Oh, They're great. Like, we should have done this ages ago. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Why are we doing it today? We should have done it like years ago. And yeah, yeah. Because data therapy, as the word implies, is also for them exactly. to understand their own field. Exactly. And um, they're basically, I mean, I always say that building an enterprise knowledge graph is a challenge for the organization because maybe for the yeah. first time in their lives, they need to be explicit about the terminology <laughs> they use. So true. So true. Yeah. And, and and I think that it, at first, it's a little scary, you know, like people get scared, like, well, this is my job security. I've, I've heard that a lot. Like, oh no, but I can't, I can't, this is my stuff. And that's why I stick around. <laughs> but then yeah. I think when they start to see that that specialty that they're, that is in their brain is mm-hmm. now something that they can use and scale. And it's, it's something that there's still, you know, humanly, they, they understand way more than a machine is ever going to know. Right. So that, that helps with the whole job security, um, you know, fear. But then I feel like, people get so, uh, it's freedom for them, right? Because it's now so explicit that they don't have to keep explaining it and explaining it and explaining it. And it can actually be used appropriately. And in a way, I think a lot of us too, you know, we put so much blood, sweat and tears into our job that to know that our knowledge can live on in a way uh, through the Mm -hmm. knowledge graph is, is really nice to know that, you know, if you decide to leave your job or maybe something happens and you retire early or something like that, yeah, your work isn't going to fall over after you leave, which is really important. Yeah, and it doesn't uh, actually render this person unneeded because exactly. when exactly. when we have when we're setting these kinds of we call them control vocabularies, for example, mm-hmm. then we do in order to in order to say that it is of quality, we have said that it needs to have ownership, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. ownership mm-hmm. like at, at least one person, a contact person, but also ownership in a team in case individuals leaves, but the team yep. remains. Yep. And so this person actually becomes much more important because they're now the contact person and the person yep. people go ask about yep. these things and they're yep. named for it. Yeah, yeah, and it's that uh, that attribution I think that also helps. There's so many um, silent heroes at our organizations, and this helps them have that ownership. And and get that 
credits almost on even like the minute things that keep the business running that a lot of folks might not have normally been able to to find and acknowledge yeah and it's inter- it's interesting another another reaction i have to all of this is oh artificial intelligence doesn't have to be creepy <laughs> <laughs> oh that's great i like that one a lot it doesn't have to be- <laughs> most of the people i talk to they're like oh it's magic it's so sexy it's so cool yeah. and it's like yeah, I, I don't hear the creepy part as much, but you know, I can certainly see how that's uh, a popular thinking around it. When you're working with designers or artists or very hum- humane people, which IKEA is full yeah. of, like yeah. the whole culture is about we're these we're these humble people from Sweden, from this small town in Sweden that you know happen to make this great furniture, and all we care about yeah. is a better life for for anyone, yeah. for, or for the many people, as we yeah. say it in IKEA. Yeah. So, so the values are very humanistic, very nice. um, inclusive, and it is not a tech company at all. Yeah. It's a furniture yep. company. Yep. Yep. And, or home furnishing, um, interior design company, yep. and that means that for them, machine learning. They, they, the first question is, what about data security and GDPR and, yep. and those kind of things? They're yep. super critical. Yeah. And. And when I explain to them that with the knowledge graphs, you can have a say in artificial intelligence, like yeah. in the human voice uh, yeah. into artificial intelligence, because knowledge graphs comes from semantic web, which is symbolic yeah. AI. So yeah. we explain to the computer symbols humans use. Exactly. Then they're like, then they light up and like, oh, so it's not creepy and it's not cold, but it's actually bringing the human voice. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I, I think that that is a fabulous model for anybody watching. Uh, to, to follow is your company, right? So IKEA is human first and people first. And so because of your ethics that your whole company is is doing regardless of tech, you've you've ethically built out what you're doing and you have made it equitable for all the voices. And I think that is beautiful. And that is the way to scale things like these ivory towers are not going to cut it. And oftentimes those ivory towers are built by, you know, certain persona that, you know, are not very inclusive. And this is a way to, to help kind of break into the ivory tower a little bit too, which I love. I mean, good software is when you take the human out of the loop, right? Like it's, it's optimized for uh, having like being as automatic as possible and, yeah. and lowering the manual effort as much as possible. Yeah. And I'm not saying that knowledge, building a knowledge graph is inefficient. I'm saying that knowledge graph is designed to have the human in the loop in the right place at the right time. Exactly. Exactly. It's it, And that's that. That's a good highlight is, yeah, we, you don't want to handcraft everything and use that, um, that handcrafted, not rigorous, not standardized human yeah. interpretation of things. Um, you know, in your machine learning, because then you don't have a common vocabulary is a great example. When I say customer, do you mean the same thing as customer? But I think that's where the knowledge graph piece comes in. The strongest is it it forces that dialogue. Well, what do you mean by customer? How do I define customer? Is the machine defining it the same way we're defining it? (laughs) Right? And is the customer same in this cultural context and this cultural context? Yeah. So like the bedroom and like bedroom is something we can recognize in Western culture, but um, in Japan, you basically create your bed into the same space where you had dinner before. Yeah. 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 So it's not about rooms anymore. It's about it, spaces, and yeah. just time constraints and yeah. And, and I mean, I, I, I'm a big fan of like color theory. I, I do a lot of mm-hmm. that because um, the data visualization kind of work that I do. And um, there's, and I'll maybe put it up on the screen somewhere. There's this beautiful um, graphic on all of the different, you know, majority cultures out there and the way that they interpret color. And so a great example is the color white is what in the West would be considered for weddings, but in some, like in Japan, it's the color for a funeral and it's very different. And if you weren't aware of those things, if you didn't have uh, a way of translating those things across cultures and making sure that the machine understands that translation, you could be making some very bad recommendations on a product, (laughs) for instance. Yeah, yeah. We're actually working exactly on color theory. Oh yeah. <laughs> Today we are modeling. Um, oh fun. Because in, in interior design, obviously it has a place in terms of what goes well together. Mm-hmm. And um I I'm still like a, a, a fan of a hybrid approach that you take best of both worlds of machine learning and 
using knowledge graphs. So I could imagine that in the future, um, like recommendation algorithms are based on some some human knowledge on what goes well together. Oh, for sure. But then, but then it does the heavy lifting from visual similarity and computer yep. vision. Yep. But then perhaps the computer vision knows what it is making the similarity on. Is it yeah. similar in color or similar in shape or yep. those kind of things? And then that's 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 what we want to see in the future is hybrid approaches. No, but it's, there is a, there's something very interesting there as well, like, what, what are we basing recommendations currently in, e- in the e-commerce space? Yeah. Uh, we're basing them on um, personal data that you have consented to using cookies. But yep. because of like GDPR in Europe, uh, mm-hmm. less and less people actually consent to sharing that knowledge. <laughs> yeah. So, so all the data for recommendations, which are now nowadays um, purely based on machine learning, is, is, like, is getting less and less. Yeah, yeah. But what can you base your recommendations on? Yeah, general knowledge of what goes well together. Exactly, right? exactly. And that model, that model is missing in most of the e-commerce stores. Yeah, yeah. But they would be brought in with a knowledge graph, and it's definitely one of our selling points for recommendation. Yeah, that they can like in in case they have personal data, they can operate with that. But they can get some get a get a baseline, get like a, yeah. a little bit like common sense in yep. for Google Maps products yep. that yep. they did. Yeah, like have a common sense for um home furnishing and for this like interior design yeah and then then there's all, always like you can go so far with that because what you can also do is hey tell us a little bit about yourself like you could ask the customer if you don't have data to yep. be like you know what are you interested in today yep. you could put it yep. in a very friendly way yep. a little bit like a person at a store would talk yes, to you like exactly. this person, like you, you walk into ikea Surely you don't want your stalker, like the, the shop, the retail person you're meeting to be like some stalker who already yeah. knows everything about you. No, you want to have a fresh plate and they're like, what are you, what are you looking right. for today? Right. That is also one critical aspect when I'm I'm upskilling the knowledge modelers yeah. that the, the there is like some pain to learning um, about the standards of RDF and OWL and how all of that works, the triples, yep. what's a URI, what's an IRI, yep. what's a local name, those kind yep. of things. Yep. But then the tooling, like the tooling is very critical as yes. well for them to actually do their work and understand, okay, when I do this, um, it, it is it, it, like, this is what it means. Yeah. Here are the ramifications of that decision. Yeah. Yeah. So we are currently, um, we're also revisiting that and looking very carefully yeah. at what kind of tooling really empowers yeah. people who are being upskilled to knowledge builders. But yeah. at the same time, I try to start the training without any tooling so that yeah. the tooling doesn't shape their thinking, but they their thinking is yeah. based on some theory. Actually. Yeah, I, I think that's a really smart decision because um, I think as soon as you start to add in the tooling, you know, to your point, it kind of leads them in a certain direction. But I also think it it can be intimidating. Oh, now I need to learn a new tool and I need to remember my login. And I have to, you know, cool. some people feel like this, this need to go out and learn as much as they possibly can about a new tool while completely missing the point that sometimes, especially if you're new to uh, modeling in general, it's about the thought process. That's where you start. It's the thought process. How do you yeah. think about these things? How do you define these things instead of what tool you're going to use? I mean, obviously you have to get to that point, but if you don't understand, if you don't think graph, if you don't think in networks and and buckets and and clusters, yeah. you're not going to understand the tool very much either. Yeah, but most people do think in graph. Actually, that's the they fun do. thing that yeah. the main experts are like, oh yeah, it's like a mind map. I I actually do like it's very yeah. intuitive, and that's why visual editing is so important. Yeah, that that currently yep. we have just like hierarchy and tabular representations for. Mm-hmm editing ontologies and taxonomies, Mm -hmm. but we should really have graph like visuals to editing tools for, because that's how most people think. Absolutely. Like uh, the buy-in for Mm -hmm. a knowledge graph project uh, usually comes from management the moment they see the graph. Exactly. Yep. (laughs) Exactly. I couldn't agree more. 